Hey guys, this is an update on, you know, just showing you my 42 positions. I really would like to get a th an even thousand shares of BAK, to be honest, um, and then maybe stop at that. Um, main 64, SJT 250, and I think I got about 267 or so in my taxable kind of SJT. PBR got 43. Um, these were these companies that just bought because they had a really low P ratio, and so far they've been doing pretty good. Um, <clears throat> got the wine company, got the tree company. This one I stole from uh, Pal Brary or whatever, who put 80% of his U.S. holdings in this one the other day. Smith and Wesson because I think at some point all hell is going to break loose and <clears throat> there's going to be blood in the streets and guess what when there's blood in the streets you're going to need guns right you're going to need guns to protect your property you're going to need guns to protect yourself um, these I really like the Loma, CPAC, the CX um, Vale, um, AIV I thought was a spinoff of like O or something, but I was wrong. I think AIV spun off something else. But um, it's a small company, so hopefully it'll grow. This this one is another teeny tiny company, along with that wine company up here. The both all of these are teeny tiny companies, like thirty million market cap or something. Uh, I'm even surprised M1 Finance even has them listed as something to invest in. Um, the problem with M1 Finance to me is eventually if there's not enough people buying a security, they won't even have it as an option to buy anymore. So sometimes some of these smaller companies uh, that I would like to invest in, I can't necessarily buy them because they're not listed. Chocolate, chocolate thing, uh, you know, maybe this will be the next Seize Candy. Who knows? You know, that when Buffett bought Seize Candy for $25 million it, in the lifetime that he's owned it has produced $2 billion in, um, in profits. So, um, then most of these are my... Um, dividend challengers and as you can see that I like the fact that you can buy fractional shares on M1 Finance um, so anyway you know I'm up on some down on some the when you concentrate in one security um, the gains are magnified and the losses are magnified so you know if you don't like losing or you're scared of losing um, you gotta maybe not put as much as me but I have no problem if this thing drops 75 percent tomorrow like I'm not gonna sell it um, when I bought it at 12 the 52 week range was 12 to 25 so um, I, th I think at some point in the future at least it was going to go back to 25 and uh, then it ended up dropping all the way down to I don't know seven or eight maybe maybe nine I can't remember but then it went back to almost 12 on the news that two companies were trying to buy half of the company and uh, in the last couple of weeks or so it's gone back down and uh, Petrobras actually owns uh, almost half of BAK You know, I would say I'm probably a cigarette butt, you know, a, a cigar butt in, 
investor where I'm buying the one free puff of companies but you know to really uh, generate a lot of wealth over a long period of time it's easier to buy great businesses at fair prices and um, you know if you can own one percent of you know five or six great businesses you know one or two really is all you need but if you know like I said that um, Indian dude who he only had he had two he picked uh, Titan which was um, an Indian company that uh, was in jewelry and uh, the other one was a pharmaceutical one and at the time they were only three percent of his portfolio and um, over the next 20 years, um, Titan be, became 50% of his portfolio, and Titan alone was worth $2 billion. And um, the other one, I'm sure, was close to that as well, at least a billion maybe. But um, yeah, the, he, he found companies that were compounding at 30%. Um, and it's easier to find a, find a great company and just stick with it than it is to get a 30% return every year um, and, and change your whole portfolio around to try to try to meet that mark so so I kind of understand how why Buffett changed his strategy you know whereas before when he started he was a pure Ben Graham looking for net nets, looking for things that were, you know, terrible businesses that were just undervalued. But, you know, a terrible business isn't going to thirty get you 30% return for the next 40 years. You know, a, a real crappy business, you know, that's undervalued, you know, might go up and, and hopefully return to its book value or maybe even a little more on some rosy news. But, um, you know, if you can find the next Coca-Cola, the next Google, the next Amazon, you know, um, and the reason I look a lot of times in these foreign countries is because I believe the U.S. market is still way overvalued. and there's a lot of better deals around the world even though the risk might be higher based on the country you know so you might say I'm too heavily invested in Brazil and you might be right but um, you gotta go where the ugliness is you gotta go where the stocks are hated you know and um, I was watching that one podcast from February, which was a year ago, and he liked Turkey because they had 80% inflation. And um, but the ones he chose were were the ones that basically um, were using the the Turkish currency, but but yet their business traded in euros so all their profits were in euros so the devaluation of the currency in um, Turkey really didn't bother didn't hurt that company um, you know a couple years ago I liked Argentina um, you know maybe there's opportunities in Japan they're sure sure as hell was opportunities in Africa but in South America and India and places like that but um, it's it's harder to um, to buy some of those securities unless you actually call the brokerage over there and set up an account over there in that country um, um, South Korea um, Luxembourg you know all these um, I, I like Israel because a lot of people in Israel they're good with money they're they, they don't have any debt so 
Um, there's there's opportunities all over the world. So um, even though I, I love the U.S. and and I think the U.S. will do do well in the long long run, um, I'm open to you know other countries um, and and it's kind of good to find securities that not everyone in the world is buying because maybe you're you know uncovering a hidden gem that most eyes haven't seen yet or maybe they haven't seen in several years um, you know a lot of times when I buy some of these uh, unknown securities that nobody else cares about no one else is looking at um, nothing happens for a long time and even when there's good news <coughs> the uh, stock will go down and it doesn't make any sense but you know eventually there will be another value investor out there that will agree with me and uh, it's funny that most of the stocks I buy you know like six months eight months later there'll be an article on Zach's there'll be an article on um, Seeking Alpha there'll be an article on all these kinds of things motley fool you know and and I've already bought the thing like a year ago and then the, you know they were writing articles about how terrible the country was and then after I buy you know a year a couple months to a year later they're writing articles about how great it is you know um, so but when when you see articles like that when you see when you buy security and you see a bunch of articles that are you know, hey, this thing's way undervalued. You know, this one is um, trading at two times earnings. You know, this one's got a great dividend. Um, you know, and and the same thing was true with Petrobras. Like the the general public hated Brazil. The you know the U.S. the finance people. You know, they they hated it. They thought it was a piece of shit. And then all of a sudden, you know, now now everyone is like talking about how great, you know. Um, so that's why I like to shut out the noise of everyone else, do my own research, um, and like I said, you can't trust what they say on the news because a lot of times the banks are telling, they're paying someone to get on TV to tell you to buy something at the same time they're actually selling it and they're and not only that not only are they selling it but they're shorting the stock and then they they, they short it past your uh loss provision that's why i think it's horrible to ever put a loss provision in because if i buy any security that is undervalued i want it to go down 50 percent why because i can buy it at a lower price and pick up more shares so I'm not going to put a stop loss on, you know, like again, a McDonald's hamburger. Um, you know, if, if a McDonald's hamburger, you, you think it's a dollar and it's trading for 50 cent the next day, you're not just not going to go buy a McDonald's hamburger because it's 50% cheaper. You know, that's stupid. So I think it's good to know what you own, you know, know what the value is or at least have a range or an idea of what you believe the value is not some idiot that slaps a multiplier out of their ass oh this has got a 15 multiplier on it oh this is um this one's got a 20 multiplier oh well they had um their growth or whatever has been 15 percent last year so we're just gonna tack on 15% growth for the next 40 years. I mean, what a bunch of idiots, you know, like they, they pulled this shit out of their ass, you know, like they don't know what the fuck they're talking about. That's why they don't make any money because they don't know what the hell they're talking about. Um, you know, they just try to be average because average keeps, your, keeps their job. So all they care about is average. All they care about is assets under management so they can rip you off with a two flat uh, fee every year 
I mean, when you're only getting seven, a 7% 7 return and you're having to pay 2%, uh, a flat fee for a terrible uh, performance, I mean, they're basically stealing a third of your, your wealth. You know, 2% may not sound like much, but 2% compounded over 40, 50, 60 years, and then you pass it on to your kids, and then it's compounding for another 80 years, 100 years. I mean, 2%, uh, you know, you're talking hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars that you're giving these idiots that don't know what the fuck they're doing. And... Um, you know, but they suck. You know that they suck. There's there's a couple good ones, but like I said, eighty percent uh, do nothing. It's, it would be better for people just to buy the index if you know nothing. Just buy the index. That's all you gotta do. Buy the index. Buy the total stock market. Buy the total bond market. Buy the S and P five hundred. Buy whatever. You know, but. You got a whole industry that that basically is worthless. That you know, at the end of someone's life, you like to say, "Well, I did something good," you know. And then, but a lot of these people, they they have done nothing but rob generational wealth from people, and um, they don't care about making money for you. All they care about is finding the next sucker that will give them some money so they can get a 2% flat fee off the top. And and most of them, they don't know how to value a business. They don't know, uh, they wouldn't know cheap if it slaps them in the face. And, um, you know, and then when you're, when you're consumed and when you're in the world of finance all the time, and and you're watching the tickers non-stop every day you you cannot be objective and to be a good investor you have to like Buffett did you have to step away from Wall Street you got to go out in the farms or you know go to the beach or somewhere far away from anything financial and you just got to think and read and and do your research and and don't be biased um you know i'll watch the news every once in a while and and i'll watch them talk about uh things but a lot of times i'm not i don't care what they think about stocks or you know i'm looking for more macro stuff you know um you know maybe uh you know oil prices in the next couple years or you know when the pandemic hit the tree the trees the the tree prices went up crazy so that that was the reason one of the main reasons why real estate went up crazy because um you know i know that you can build a house uh just the materials for a house were 70 dollars a square foot before the pandemic i don't know what they're selling at now but you know, when I was looking at a house that the, was selling for thirty dollars a square foot, um, and if I know that it costs seventy dollars a square foot just for the brick and mortar and wood and everything like that, you know, like um, you know, you're getting something undervalued. You know, if you're paying, um, you know, a thousand dollars a square foot and you don't have marble countertops and you don't have um, you know fancy designs on the wall and ex excellent craftsmanship you know you're getting your ass ripped off but um, anyway I'm not saying I'm an expert I, you know I, I'm not the smartest person in the world and um, you know maybe I'm still in the cigar phase just like uh, Seth Carmen said, you know, um, and he's been doing this for 40 years or, or more. And, uh, but I think with a little bit of, 
a little bit of research, a little bit of um, hard work, we can we can um, reach some educated decisions and make some some educated bets and and do better than the market. I mean, if you buy the S and P 500 index today, you know, 20% of the S and P 500 index is in those. Fang stocks. You know, Netflix, I think, is overvalued. Apple is overvalued. Tesla definitely is overvalued. Uh, you know, two two years ago or three years ago, the profits for Tesla was five hundred thousand dollars. That was it, and and all of that money was um, tax credits for quote quote green energy tree huggers. You know. Um, so really they, they made no money you know they, they just got a, a handout from the government but um, you know then you got Facebook Microsoft Google I like Microsoft and Google I do I do think that their uh, runway is still a long way to go and with AI and robotics and, and space travel and all that kind of stuff, I think um, they would, I think they're going to do well for a long time. Um, anyway, thanks for listening, guys.